Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour in Book of Luke. Luke being translated meaning light giver, and all oh, does he bring forth the light. There's ever so much in this book, and what an appropriate time right now to teach this book. Luke, of course, was probably the better educated of any of the disciples, and as much as he was a physician, and uh, Paul would even call him the physician. Uh, he was a medical doctor, and um, he things very concise, and, and so he did. So Luke is a little different than the other Gospels in as much as the Gospel of Matthew would present Messiah as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, whereas Mark would present um, Messiah as Yahweh's servant, and um, the book of John would present Messiah as God himself. And here in Luke, Luke presents God, as it is written in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12, as the branch that is the friend of sinners and publicans, the man of God, being God in man form. Uh, and probably Luke mentions women in his writings more than any of the other disciples, uh, gives credit to them where, when they are ministering and when they are uh, assisting in bringing forth the gospel. But here that light giver comes forth, and within this, Luke is concise to the point that he even gives dates, if you know how to interpret them. So having said that, let's get right into it. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, let's go with it. Uh, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, that's to say Christianity, how things happen, many have set forth, what he's saying here, I want to do it and I want to be very concise. I want to be right to the point of exactly with eyewitnesses how it happened. Verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, which, for the, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. We observed it, we saw it with our own eyes come to pass, and I'm going to tell you exactly how it happened as that eyewitness. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. This, this would be better translated from the very first, from above. Okay, uh, Perfect understanding of all things from above. To write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopolis. Now, Theopolis means beloved of God, and I think it, rather than being transliterated, it should have been translated because it's written to you, and not Theopolis, uh, who was a nice person and all that, but it should have been translated uh, beloved of God because you are beloved of God if you love him and you want to study his word. So what we have the field set forth here is as the branch, the friend to all that would receive, Luke wants to be very concise and, and strict in bringing forth the events so that you have a true report exactly as it went down. Verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed, that you have an absolute account. That's, that's what I want you to have is what he's saying here. That, that, that's comforting, beloved, because if you take your time and you analyze the book of Luke, that's what you get. Verse 5, he begins the report. There, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, that means remembered of Yah, <coughs> of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, that means she was of the Levitical priesthood herself, 
and her name was Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, of course, means the, the oath of Yah. All these names are kind of important, but the main thing is that don't overlook anything that Luke is bringing forth. Let's take the course of Abiah. There were 24 courses that the Levitical priest would serve in the temple. It would, uh, it would last um, a period of time, and it's a date. Okay. It gives you a date when this went down, specifically of a certainty. It would be from, uh, Zechariah would be serving the course of Abiah, which would happen on, I'm going to use our calendar rather than the Hebrew calendar, from June the 15th to June the 19th. You need to make a note of that. His course of Abiah, that's a date from June the 15th until June the 19th. Then Elizabeth, of course, being of the Levitical priesthood, would have to have been a full-blood Levite to have been married to a Levitical priest who was um, uh, in the position of serving one of the courses, which in his case was Abiah. Verse 6, And they went both, and they were both righteous before God, good people, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. They fulfilled all the legal religious requirements to be priest and priest's wife. Seven, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken in years. So they, they were advanced in years and what is going to be a miracle about this is you're going to have two pregnancies in this chapter. One will be Elizabeth, the other will be Mary. For Elizabeth, hers would seem to be too late because she was too old, and Mary too soon because she wasn't even totally married yet. Verse 8, as we continue, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, this would be Zechariah, before God, in the order of his course, that'd be Abiah, 9, that'd be June the 15th to the 19th, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. It was his time to do this. Now, understand this. It was the custom that when he would burn the incense, the smoke would go up. And the people outside could see the smoke, and they always believed that if they said their prayers, right at that moment, that the prayers went up with the smoke of the incense. Okay, so many people are gathered there with their prayers ready to go. Verse 10, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, with that being their belief that the prayers went up with it. Of course, that's traditions of men. Verse 11, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. I mean, in person, there he was. And this would be Gabriel, man of God, being interpreted. Verse 12, And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. You know, when God sends a, a, a messenger it is a very stressful time on one receiving them. It is not an ordinary thing. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for the, thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, Yohanan. Now, this is strange because in Zacharias' family there was no Yohanan. But God is demanding through Gabriel that he call him this, which is to say Yahweh's gift, and certainly it was a gift from God. The prayer was answered, 14. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. It's going to be fantastic, 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. That means even before his birth, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, while even in Elizabeth's womb. Verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. In other words, with his teaching, with his instruction, 
Um, there, there will be many of this world that will be turned to the true father because of this teaching and because of this child. Verse 17, listen carefully now. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. That's Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That is to say, that voice crying in the wilderness that would lead many to understand the real truth of God's teaching. Now, many people just really run away with a statement when it is given. Did that verse say that John the Baptist was Elijah? And many of you might say, well, yes, it did. No, it didn't. It didn't say that at all. It said, quite frankly, it said that, be, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Not that he was Elijah. Quite frankly, in Matthew chapter 11, you will find there, if the people had received him, he would have been Elijah because there would not have been a second advent, but the people did not receive him, nor did they receive Messiah. They beheaded John the Baptist, this one, and, and so it was that he was, but still that does not take away from the fact that he came in the spirit of Elijah. And many, many people were turned to the Lord because of him. Verse 18, And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? He's questioning him. For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. God won't like this. Here he's a Levitical priest. And he's been praying for this. You understand that? He has been praying for this because he said your prayer is answered. And yet when it came to pass, he's a doubter. How is this going to be? It's going to tick Gabriel off and probably tick the father off. Okay. Because observe what happens here. Next verse, please. Verse 19. And the angel, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, and that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Um, in other words, um, this is an angel that actually tends the altar of God, the nearest to him. That's why the word Gabriel being translated rather than transliterated is man of God. This angel was called a man of God, and there he was right before the altar. He doesn't like it because Zacharias has questioned. It's all right to ask, how can this be? But to show doubt, that doesn't cut it. Verse 20, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now this is, a, for a preacher, this is a pretty hard penalty to take his voice because a preacher without a voice, without a mouth, is just about useless. That is to say, as far as teaching verbally is concerned, uh, he's kind of out of business until this season is all over with. Why was that? Well, he doubted. He doubted the very word of God. I'm going to tell you something. You don't ever want to do that. You might say, well, how did God really know? God knows what you're even thinking. Don't ever try to con the Father or you're going to come up short-changed, okay? Verse 21, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple like he was never going to come out. 22, And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. He waved his arms and tried to make signals and and everything else, but he couldn't say a word. He was speechless. Um, and, and by keeping making the signs, I'm sure he was overjoyed, but he couldn't share that with them. Why? Because he doubted. 
Verse 23, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, that would be the 19th and he's completed and now we're on the 20th, June the 20th, he departed to his home, own home. Now it's about 40 miles away. He doesn't have a jet and he doesn't have a car. And it's going to take him a couple of days to get home. So it, uh, about two days, let's say, from the 20th, it'll take him at least the 22nd to get home, 24. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. <clears throat> now, she prob the conception took place between the 23rd and the 24th of June. And when you add five months to that, you come to November the 24th. These dates are important, so I hope you're making note. This would bring you, at her five months period of time, we, it brings us to November the 24th, verse 25. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. She, she was thrilled. 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, now, well, now what would that be? Well, that would be one month later. This takes us to December the 25th. This is very important because this is the day of Mary's conception, not the date of Christ's birth, but is the date of Christ's conception. You that have companion Bibles, your appendix 179 documents all this to the day, day by day, uh, on the conception and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, do not let this take anything away from you. Because when did the Lord begin dwelling, as you're going to find out in this chapter, with us? On December the 25th. The Holy Spirit dwelt with us because when Elizabeth, after, after she, is, she conceives here, she's going to run immediately to Elizabeth, her cousin. And John, six months in the womb, leapt when he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit and he was filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. So any way you want to look at it, Christ began dwelling with us on December the 25th, the day of the conception. Next verse, let's go with it please, 27. To, he, he went to Galilee to a virgin espoused or betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and Mary means a tear. 28, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And certainly she was. Why? 29, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. I, I want you to see the difference in Mary and John. John doubted. Elizabeth, uh, Mary is trying to understand. It's all right to reason. It's, it's already all right to reason what it is that God would have you do so that you can follow his command. But don't doubt. Mary did not doubt. Verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Uh, now it's important that you understand this name. What does it mean? Jesus being translated Yeshua, which... Um, Interpreted means Yahweh's Savior. That's Almighty God's Savior. It's the Savior sent to save the world. And as it is written in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, listen carefully. A virgin shall conceive, this is a prophecy coming to pass, being reported concisely by Luke, that this virgin would conceive, would bring forth a son, and we should call him Emmanuel being interpreted is to say God with us. 
And that's what Yeshua means. Yahweh with us, Savior. And so it is. And as Christ would say as he walked the earth in the 14th chapter of St. John, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because it was God with us. Verse 32, to continue. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. That's the Most High God. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. It's his, and it shall be his, not for a little while, but forever and ever. 33, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's the one you want to join, my friend, if you have any intelligence at all, if you have any wisdom at all, as this physician is bringing forth this report, giving you good advice concisely, this is the party you want to belong to, is the kingdom that is forever, because about any other kingdom probably won't stand. Verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, she's not doubting here. She's just reasoning, how can it be? Fair enough, okay. And um, to, Elizabeth, to John, it seemed a little too late. To Mary here, it seems a little too early, all right. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, the most high God, shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And it was God in the flesh. Okay, Verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. Well, what is this now, the sixth month? December the 25th. That's, that's important. A lot of people say, well, I, I didn't know those dates were in the Bible. Well, they are. If you know how to read the, the concise report given to you by this one Luke, which is a light giver, which gives you the truth, the, uh, the chronology of the light himself, that is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, something very important was just stated concerning the lineage and birthright of many people. Elizabeth was called Mary's cousin. Now, well, what are the ramifications of being a cousin? I mean, let's think about this a moment. Mary, we thought, was of the tribe of Judah, and she's calling Elizabeth, who we know because it was definitely and concisely reported, she's of the tribe of Levite. She's a daughter of Aaron, full blood. And Mary is her cousin. <clears throat> so what does that mean? It means exactly this. It means that as you're going to learn in chapter 3 of this great book, which Luke brings forth with such concise uh, um, ramifications and chronology that you can't go wrong that it was Mary's father who was of the tribe of Judah but Mary's mother was of the tribe of Levi and this is well and good so therefore Christ who was born to Mary who was of the tribe of Judah as well as the tribe of Levi with Almighty God being the father thereof, you have a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is to say both of the priest line and the king line, making him Lord of Lords and King, king of Kings and Lord of Lords, being that priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is one of his names, as it is written in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, for he was as the Son of God. Why? Because he was the Son of God. No mother, no father, as he would approach Abraham way back in the Old Testament, then therefore um, we have this merging in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby there's no mystery to you 
that God's word is fulfilled. And when we get to chapter 3, it will be Joseph's, um, given under Joseph by law, okay? And I will explain that when we get there, meaning they're in-laws to Joseph, but they're Mary's true father. And believe it or not, as Joseph's genealogy is given in Matthew chapter 1, which has nothing to do basically with the birth of Christ, because it's his adopted father's name, but it goes back from Abraham to, uh, to uh, uh, Joseph. But the lineage that you will find in chapter 3 goes from Mary's father all the way back to Adam. And that's important. I'll say it again. The lineage in chapter 3 of this great book, to show you the concision, goes from not just back to Abraham, but all the way to Adam. Eth ha-adam, giving you the proper lineage through which Christ would come. These are all very important points. The, the concise report that this physician brings forth. You see, he, he was a scribe as well as a physician because much of the New Testament with Paul, he was the scribe that wrote the report. And, um, and he brings forth such a wonderful report. So again, what day are we on? Six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy. She received her pregnancy on the 23rd, 24th of June. And here it is now, December, six months later, December the 25th, on the day that Elizabeth conceived. Well, what can we make of this? Well, I don't know. Let's read on. Next verse, please, 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. He, he, that's why, uh, are you worried about something? Do you have a problem? Nothing's impossible with God, our Heavenly Father. Verse 38, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She accepted it. She didn't question it. And, um, and uh, there it was given. I mean, here, usually, do you know what the penalty would be for a single girl here stoning? Verse 39, but God told her not to fear through the Gabriel. And Mary arose, verse 39, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, uh, the same day, with haste, into a city of Judah. 40, and where did she go? And entered into the house of Zacharias. This is the priest of the Levitical priesthood of the course of Abiah. And saluted Elizabeth, gave her a salutation. Do you know what happened then? This is extremely important. You listen carefully. 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit had approached on the day of conception. Well, then when does a soul begin to dwell in an embryo? Well, I think that's pretty self-evident, is it not? It, the very Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of, of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Almighty God, was dwelling within the womb of Mary. And when she approached, John, still in the, I mean, an embryo in his mother's womb, could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, and Elizabeth, this Levitical uh, priestess, uh, leapt with joy. And how precious it is. Many might say, well, I, I didn't know when life began uh, uh, in, in a pregnancy. Well, it was just answered for you by Almighty God. It was answered in such a way that, you know, you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the package to understand that. That the Holy Spirit, the very spirit of the entity, begins dwelling at conception. God plans it so, it is so, end of story. That is a fact, and that's the way it is. So, 
what, what a beautiful chapter. I want you to remember the course of Abiah from the 15th to the 19th of June. The angel appearing within that week before the 19th, or, and then on the 20th, he heads for home, 40 miles. If he makes 20 miles a day, he, he's there on the 22nd or 3rd. Elizabeth conceives, and five months later, we come to November the 24th on our calendar. And then on the sixth month, which is December the 25th, Christ began dwelling with man. Don't ever let anyone take that away. That's something to truly celebrate. It truly is. And then as it's written in the, four, you know, many people take this time and they say, well, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Oh, you shouldn't? That's when the Holy Spirit began dwelling with us. That's when truly Christ began dwelling with us. Well, what about all this tree business? Well, have you never read Zechariah chapter 14 where God would say, I am a great fir tree? Fir trees have always been symbolic of our people. Why? The symbolism is that it's evergreen, meaning ever living. So what you're doing is symbolically saying in that tree, our faith is ever living and it's only symbolic. It's not something we worship. So... People could say, well, you've never read Jeremiah uh, chapter 10. Oh, I've read it in more than one language. What it means, you have some knucklehead heathens that will go out and cut a tree and slice it and decorate it and worship the tree. We do not worship the tree. The tree is only symbolic of eternal life. Because God in, in Hosea, which means salvation, if you want salvation, then you better listen to your father. The evergreen is only symbolic of eternal life. We don't worship it. It symbolizes eternal life. So it, it is your choice in that, the customs of our people. There's certainly nothing wrong with it because nothing becomes an idol until you worship it and you worship the Lord Jesus Christ. This conception that took place with Mary on that day became the Savior of the world, your Savior. And that is something for us to worship and to celebrate. And all these people that would, you know, like to drop the word Christmas, don't have anything to do with them. What, what they're saying is they don't want your business, they don't want you around really, because you're a Christian. Well, you're going a little hard there. No, I'm, I'm being quite frank. I've had enough of it. You know, if, if it's Happy Hanukkah, well then, praise God, it's Happy Hanukkah. If it's Happy Ramadan, praise God, it's Happy Ramadan. But when it is Christmas, it is Merry Christmas. It is Happy Christmas. It is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ began dwelling with men. Don't ever let some heathen take that away from you. All right, enough said. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and um, uh, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you've got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. God is our judge. That's all we need. He can handle it. He takes care of business. 
you do have the right to discern who you should study with and who has truth and who has whatever. You always hold to the truth concisely, the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and have your family blessed, whereby you have the true knowledge that you can stand and withstand any storm that might come against your family or your nation. Always remember that. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. Why? He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints. You're unique. Why? He wanted someone just like you, but he does want you to love him. He loves you, but he may not love what you do always. Return that love and you'll receive his blessings. He knows you. That's why he created you. He wants you to love him. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. Nancy from Mississippi. Do you believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, or do you believe that he was just a man because he could not be a part of it because of the flesh? No, it, he was, um, it is written in the first chapter of John, the word became flesh and walked among us. And have you ever read the first verse in the great book of St. John? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He is the Word. And have you ever read um, Deuteronomy 18.18? 18, 18? It's real easy to remember that. It's just 18.18. 18, where God promises there, I'm going, to, I'm going to raise someone up, a prophet, just like you are in the flesh, so that you can see him and believe him and follow him. And then he continues on, if you go with somebody that would lie to you and claim to be a prophet, then you'll get burned. Okay, But he promised he would send him uh, long before Christ was born, as Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 so stipulates. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, I believe that is from California, is it right to try to baptize individuals or pray for God that have already died. This is, um, this is. I mean, it's all right if you want to pray for somebody that's already passed on, but there is a kind of a false teaching. I'm not judging anyone, but unfortunately, certain people take 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, where the subject is all the way from the beginning of the 15th chapter up to that point, that if you don't believe Christ rose from the dead, why do you want to follow him? And what it really says, rather than baptizing somebody for the dead, what it really means being properly translated is this. Why would you baptize yourself in a dead man's name that never raised from the grave? Okay, the tomb. Well, certainly Christ did resurrect and we can baptize ourselves in his name. And that's what it has reference to. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do any good to baptize somebody that's already dead with a proxy, okay? That's not what it's talking about. Uh, Tiffany from Alabama. Pastor Murray, how, we, how will we be able to tell the Antichrist from the real Christ? Well, by knowing the chronology of, of events. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. The false Christ comes at the sixth trump, and we're still in flesh bodies. The true Christ comes at the seventh trump, and instantly, in the wink of an eye, as in that same 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians we were just quoting from of verse 29, all the way down to verse 52, um, it states right there, in the twinkle of an eye, as a change, we all change into spiritual bodies. So as long as you're in a flesh body and somebody claims to be Christ, they're lying to you. Okay, you got that? That's one of the simple ways, but it's an oversimplification. All you have to do is know the false one's coming first, sitting in Jerusalem claiming to be God. 
and he's nothing but a fraud because we're still in flesh bodies, but he is supernatural and the whole world will whore after him that do not have the truth of God's word. Karen from Louisiana. My husband has spoken some terrible things against the Holy Spirit, but he has repented now. How will this affect him as the Bible says that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable? Uh, Karen, that's not what it's talking about, okay? Many people may uh, use profanity and swear and many other things. Uh, that is forgivable. What it's talking about is in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, is for one of God's elect. That is somebody that knows better, okay? knows absolutely what they're doing. You're supposed to do as it is written in Mark chapter 13, allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan. That's the appearance of the false Christ. If you are one of God's elect and you refuse the Holy Spirit, that's blasphemy against him and taking up for Satan. I don't believe it'll happen, but that's unpardonable. So I can put it this way quite safely. No one at this point could have ever committed the unpardonable sin because it cannot be committed until the false Christ appears on earth. Okay, <clears throat> Luke chapter 12, verse 10. Gina from, I don't know where Gina's from. Are the Ten Commandments still in effect today? Absolutely, some of them fulfilled. Christ would say, I changed not one jot of the law, but I came to fulfill it. Okay. Now, like, he became our high Sabbath. He became our Passover, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Um, but uh, thou shalt not steal. As far as I know, you know, uh, you don't want to go around stealing thinking the law's done away with because you'll end up in the pokey. All right. And uh, the law is not changed. Matthew chapter 5 and 6 will document that. Paul from Texas. Pastor Murray, I've studied with you many years. Thank you for your teachings. I love you and your staff and family. When Satan, in, when Satan in a man's physical body goes into the temple showing himself to be God, and causing the sacrifices to stop, proclaiming himself as God, does that mean there is no temple there now in Jerusalem? Does it need to be rebuilt for when this happens? The temple is the many-membered body. He will take advantage of that. And um, uh, he will take over whatever building in that area he wishes to because every religion will worship him. Okay, you're, you're accurate in that. And you're quoting basically 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Nancy from Georgia. Why would God take your marriage relationship away from you in heaven when it is one of the most important relationships that you have here on earth and um, the, and the crea created, uh, and he created it? Because this earth age is passing. There is a marriage. Have you missed that? Haven't you ever read Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8? The marriage is with the Lamb of God. And uh, all participate in that. God doesn't take anything away that he doesn't add something much better. Uh, does uh, that mean we will know our mates on earth? When we're, absolutely. And, but w what a wonderful time. Spiritual bodies are a little different than flesh bodies, for we are all as the angels in a spirit body. Laverne from Oklahoma, I'm confused. I thought that we would be in spiritual bodies in the millennium, but you said on the first day we were, we were in flesh bodies. That, that's not, I didn't, um, if you heard that, I either misspoke or, or you misheard. Because on the first day we're all changed at that instantly. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, I just quoted it. <clears throat> the wink of an eye. We put this, this um, corruptible puts on incorruption and this mortal puts on immortality, if you make it all the way. <clears throat> we are definitely, excuse me, we're definitely in spiritual bodies through the millennium. Larry from, there is no more flesh, all over with. Larry from Florida, would you tell me where the Ten Commandments are in the Bible? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. You'll find all ten of them there. Beverly from Georgia. 
I can't find in my Bible where Satan was Cain's father and Cain and Abel were twins. What Bible are you reading from? Same one you are. Have you never read St. John chapter 8, verse 44, where it says the first murderer? Who was the first murderer? Well, what does your Bible say about the first murderer? Your Bible says it was Cain. And then it goes on and said, You are of your father the devil, and the deeds of your father you will do. And Jesus again in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 35, that's been kept secret since the beginning of the world, is the planting of the tares, that means the devil planting his seed in the Garden of Eden, those wicked, evil children called Kenites, children of Cain. And he makes it very clear, those children were planted by the devil himself uh, and uh, through impregnation. And as far as Cain and Abel being twins, the, the word in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, states very clearly that after Eve gave birth to Cain, she, where it says, and again, the word is yasof in, sof in the Hebrew tongue. It means she continued in labor. If a woman gives birth to one child and continues in labor and gives birth to another, what does that mean? means they were twins. I read the same Bible you do, but I'm reading it with understanding because of my knowledge into the Hebrew manuscripts as well, okay? Timothy from Nevada. Where in the Bible does it talk about the bag of water? Uh, probably you're thinking about St. John chapter 3, verse 5, where most people say, you got to be born again, only the word again is not correct. It's from above. You come from God. You've got to be born from God, but you've got to be born through the bag of waters, which means not as the fallen angels did. Their sin was they left their place of habitation and came to seduce woman, not to be born of her. So uh, you read it in John chapter 3, verse 5, which simply means to be born from the womb but born from above. The soul comes from above. It doesn't come from some rock out here or somewhere else. It comes from God because he created you. And as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls belong to God. That's Kenites, all races, all people, all souls belong to God. You don't get around to giving your soul to God. He's got it right there. It's his to do with as he chooses. Uh, James, when you die, you say we will have a perfect spirit. How old will we be in the spirit body? Our spirit body is perfect. It has no disease or anything like that. That's what I mean. But as far as perfection is concerned, if you're raised in a spiritual body and still have a mortal soul, you're not perfect. Okay. Perfect in the Greek tongue means maturity as well. And anyone that hasn't matured enough to know God's truth by that time is in a heap of hurt. But um, this is why it's written, it seems like we keep going back to 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53, where this mortal must put on immortality, which simply means this flesh body has got to put on the spiritual body. But the mortal, meaning your soul, has got to put on immortality. Otherwise, it's not perfect. It's spiritually dead or in a hammer. By that I mean spiritually dead, not physically dead. Um, and um, I won't go into the Greek, nikos and nikos, but it's something you should know from uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. There's a difference in flesh dead and spirit dead. Uh, but anyway, what, bring, what is the millennium about? It's teaching those that are spiritually dead, trying to prime their pump, whereby maybe, just maybe, they will grab on to a little knowledge of truth when it's right before them and overcome at the second resurrection. That's what it's all about. Daniel from Iowa, please explain Ishtar. Is this a pagan god? It is a pagan goddess, okay? Um, any, any good dictionary will answer that for you. It's where our word Easter which is not in the Bible manuscripts. It was used once in the King James in the book of Acts. 
but it, the 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 manuscripts in the place of that word Ishtar is Pathal, which is Passover. That's the high day of Christianity because Christ became our Passover, our high Sabbath. And but it was it's preacher typical preacher it, at that time in the early spring, along about the time of Passover. The heathen went out into the forest and rolled eggs, and it was a, a, a ritual of fertility. There sexual orgies going on out there, and uh, quick like a rabbit, bunny hopping, you know. And the preacher said, well, hey, you know, we could gather them into our church if we'll just roll eggs and hop like a bunny, quick like a bunny. Maybe we could get a bigger membership. Well, you know... True teachers of God's Word should not be hard up for students. If you're teaching God's Word, you're going to have more students than you can handle. Uh, God almost promises you that. The fields are white for harvest. But you've got to teach God's Word. You've got to teach the truth. That overruns with the true people. You don't need heathen to fill your church. You need people that are converted and interested in receiving truth and let the truth then convert the heathen whereby they're interested in learning and being fed. If a church feeds them, they will come. Well, what do you feed them? Word of God. That's so over simple. You know, that uh, uh, I, I don't know. People, churches claim they're losing people and they're having a hard time. Well, teach the word of God and teach it as it should be taught. And you'll have to enlarge your church. Brenda from Maryland. Uh, there will not be a rapture at all. We will be here at the sixth trump. The battle against the enemy is this correct? And you got it right. Christ is returning here. We're not flying away somewhere. But at the sixth trump, the false Christ is coming. And we don't have anything to worry about. The Holy Spirit will speak through us. Satan is not coming to destroy the world as many people think. He's coming to play Jesus. He's coming to convert it. to. It's going to be the greatest revival this world will have ever seen up to that point. Uh, people are going to flood to him because he comes in prosperously and peacefully. That's just the obvious. I mean, you know, most people say, well, he's got on red long handle underwear and he's got horns and he's got a pitchfork. Oh, the Bible doesn't say that. That's a figment of somebody's imagination. That's why a lot of people are going to be deceived. He comes in. He, he was the most beautiful of the archangels, Ezekiel chapter 28. And, and uh, that's one reason he's able to deceive a lot of people being supernatural. When Michael cast him from heaven, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, that's why it says, woe, woe, woe to you on earth. Why? Because he's down there and he knows he has but a short time. And boy, is he going to play Big Daddy. Is he going to play, I've got it all, follow me. Joanne from Arizona, are we supposed to face the east to pray? Well, if, if I had a conviction placed on me by Almighty God that I needed to face east, then I would face east. But, however, uh, God says, Iya asha Iya, that's what I, I am that I am. Uh, he is wherever he wishes to be. More than the east, the west, north, south, above, down, he's everywhere. So you can pray wherever you want to, and he's going to hear you. But it is true, it is, traditions play a, a great part, and, and it, we are instructed to face the east even with, when, in burial. A man's feet always face east so that his face, when he opens his eyes, is looking to the rising sun in the early morning. Uh, his head is facing east. As a minister, you always know you're supposed to go to the head of the casket at a burial place. And the way you know where the head is, even without asking if it's sealed, is you go to the west end of the casket because the feet are facing east and the head is on the west end looking east, okay? Um, that may be more information than was necessary, but there you have it. Okay, but what, you know, if, if God implies to you or if you have a conviction that you should, do it. 
I'm going to pray wherever I want to, whether I'm driving a car, or reading, a, whatever. I'm going to pray wherever I am, facing whatever direction. Michael from Virginia, how important is the taking of communion? I have been ill and I can't go to church. Can I do this at home? And how would I go about doing this? You take the sacraments. You ask God's blessings over those sacraments. And then you simply know as you partake of the bread that this was Christ's body that was broken for many. And and um, take ye and eat ye all of it. It's broken for you. He took the stripes. You get the healing. And then on, on the other um, sacrament, you bless the cup for it was symbolic of his blood that was shed to forgive sins, your sins, the sins of the world. Take it and drink you all of it and do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you're, that's it. You can take it anytime you want to. Any person can take it. You don't need a pastor there to do it. You can do it yourself. Just as I can say right now, I'm out of time. And I, I, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. Know what? It makes His day. Because that's the letter that he's written to you, explaining to you exactly how things transpired and what he expects of you. So it makes his day. And boy, when you make his day, he's, he's going to make yours big time. All right? Now, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good now. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word, the world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar. For if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146 Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
gold. We're not going to be talking about pyrite today, that metallic substance that looks like gold. You know, fool's gold uh, has had many a uh, inexperienced uh, prospector jumping up and down early, thinking that he struck it rich, only to find out that the metallic substance that he has is basically worthless. We are going to be talking about real gold today that belongs to fools. And I call them fools because that's what they are. If they act foolish, they're fools, right? And the reason they're foolish is because what they do with the gold or what they think they can buy with the gold. You know, there's nothing wrong with being rich with God's blessings and hard work as a result of hard